Hello everyone and welcome to my channel. This is Asif Qureshi and you are watching Dr. Asif Lectures. Today, we will talk about how to systematically approach liver function tests. So if you ever have a patient who has some liver problem and you have prescribed LFTs, liver function tests, to see what is the condition, what is the status of liver functioning, LFTs is the report that you should master, okay? If you have not subscribed to the channel, please subscribe to the channel and hit the bell icon so that you are updated with all the upcoming videos. Now, before we start the liver function tests, let's talk about liver itself. Now, this is um, one of the largest organs of your body occupying a major chunk of your abdominal cavity. And you must know what are the inputs in terms of blood supply to the liver. So we have two different inputs. One is the hepatic artery, which is coming from the heart and carrying the oxygenated blood. And the other input, actually the larger input, is from the gastrointestinal tract via the portal vein. So whatever you eat, all the drugs and all those things, they enter the liver first via the hepatic artery portal vein. So there are two inputs, okay? And in terms of output, there are also two outputs. The first output is, which is what we call the endocrine output, where whatever is synthesized in the liver goes into the bloodstream in the hepatic vein, which goes into the heart and then to the whole circulation. And the second output is the exocrine output, which is via the ducts. Whatever is synthesized within the liver gets into right and left hepatic ducts and then enter in the common hepatic duct which is joined by gallbladder cystic duct and at the end is formed the common bile duct CBD. And this common bile duct basically drains into duodenum. So this is the normal input and the output mechanisms of the liver. Two inputs and two outputs. The two inputs are hepatic artery and portal vein and the two outputs are one is the endocrine output via the hepatic vein and the other one is the exocrine output via the ductular system which drains into duodenum. okay? So once this concept is clear in your head, let's talk about how does a routine LFT report looks like. So this is how, when you have in your hand uh, a routine liver function test report, this is how it looks like. It tells you about total bilirubin. I've hidden the patient identity for um, you know patient confidence levels and um, uh, anonymity of the report. But anyways, look at the values. They talk about serum total bilirubin, direct bilirubin, indirect bilirubin, ALT, AST, alkaline phosphorase, and gamma GT, okay? In many of the hospitals, doctor also require albumin levels and PT to be reported as part of LFTs, okay? Because albumin levels and PT have important liver function prediction values, and we will talk about them. So if we analyze this whole report, there are two types of parameters, okay? The first type of parameter is this, which is what we call cytotoxic or the damage associated parameters. Now, these are the parameters which are affected whenever there is liver cellular injury, okay? Um, and these include AST, ALT, albumin, and prothrombin time, PT. And then there are markers which are associated with cholestasis. Cholestasis is any blockage of liver ductular system and those markers are alkaline phosphatase, ALP, gamma glutamyl transferase, which is GGT, total bilirubin, direct bilirubin, and INDA. So you should know that on an LFT report, these are the two set of markers that you will be interpreting, that you will be analyzing. These are cytotoxic markers or the damage markers and the cholestatic markers and we will deal with them one by one. Now, before we really talk about the cytotoxic markers, um, you should know that this is a liver hepatocyte and any injury or any inflammation associated with the hepatocyte, it contains inside the hepatocyte, it contains these two enzymes, which are called AST, also known as SGOT and SGPT, ALT. So these are released. It is like the cardiac injury, you know, the cardiac markers. Similarly, if hepatocyte is injured or inflamed, these levels in the blood go up, okay? These markers are inside the hepatocyte and they are released whenever there is hepatic injury. Now, remember, ALT is more specific for liver injury, AST is a little less specific, but this is paradoxic. This is opposite the case if there is alcoholic hepatitis. In alcoholic hepatitis, AST is more sensitive. So remember this, in general, ALT is more sensitive to liver diseases, but in alcoholic, 
EST levels are higher than ALT in patients with alcoholic hepatitis, okay? Now, AST and ALT levels are high in all forms of hepatic injury. Whenever there is hepatic inflammation, these levels go up, okay? It's only marker for acute disease. In chronic disease, actually, they may go down. You know why? Because in order to get high AST and ALT levels, you need hepatocyte to be rupturing. If there is a chronic disease, most of the hepatocytes are, you know, they are actually transformed into a fibrotic tissue. There are no more cells. If there are no cells, they will not be ruptured and ASTLT will not be released. So, so remember, these are the markers only for acute problem, okay? And these are not actually markers for liver function. Liver function markers are those which we will discuss later, okay? And they are very good markers for liver inflammation. So if AST and ALT levels are high, what does that mean? That means acute inflammation of liver. It can be because of any cause. It can be because of uh, viruses. It can be because of drugs. It can be because of alcohol, anything, okay? The other marker is albumin. Now, albumin is actually a marker for hepatocellular injury and uh, it's a functional indicator. What do we mean by a functional indicator? If albumin levels are deranged, the liver is not functioning properly, okay? And it takes a little long time for albumin levels to derange, okay? Why? Because the half-life of albumin is approximately 20 days. So you will not be able to figure out any differences in albumin level at least up to 20 days. So if the liver is not functioning today, the albumin levels will be starting to be affected at least after 20 days, okay? But if albumin levels are low, think about chronic liver injury, okay? And then we have prothrombin time. Now, prothrombin time is basically affected by a lot of clotting factors. Clotting factors 2, 7, 9, 10, 1, 5. All these proteins are involved in the prothrombin time, in the clotting of blood, okay? And if any one of the protein is disturbed, not being synthesized, the prothrombin time will be delayed. It's also reported as international normalized ratio, which is INR. So a pro prothrombin time of 10 is usually, usually INR of 1. If your report says INR of 2, that means the prothrombin time has increased. That means one of these factors are not there. That means the liver is not functioning. Actually, this prothrombin time is one of the most sensitive tests to investigate liver function because it involves so many proteins. And if any of the protein is not available, the prothrombin time goes up. So therefore it is very, very sensitive marker, okay? But the prothrombin time can also be raised if there is vitamin K deficiency, if the patient is on coumarins, or if the patient is hemophilic. So always before interpreting liver damage for increased INR values, ask the patient, are you on any drugs? Do you have history of hemophilia? Do you have any history of vitamin K injections or low vitamin K levels? So always investigate that whatever you are interpreting is actually the right interpretation and there is no other confounder available, okay? So that's all about the cytotoxic markers. AST, ALT, albumin, and prothrombin time, okay? Now let's talk about cholestatic markers. Now cholestatic markers are these, alkaline phosphorase, total bilirubin, direct bilirubin, and indirect bilirubin. Let's dissect it out. So this is your liver. What happens normally? You have red blood cells. And red blood cells, after 120 days, they, they are broken down. And they are broken down, and they generate a lot of things. One of the product is unconjugated bilirubin, which is which were also called indirect bilirubin. So red blood cells break down in your spleen and macrophages, release this. So you have indirect unconjugated bilirubin. It goes where? It goes in the liver. And in the liver, conjugation happens. And as a result of conjugation, liver releases what? Direct bilirubin. So that's the normal cycle, guys. You have red blood cells, they break down, they produce unconjugated bilirubin, it goes in the liver, gets conjugated and gets out of the liver as conjugated bilirubin, okay? And you remember that this conjugated bilirubin can be now excreted in the urine, which is what we call bilirubin urea, okay? Bilirubin urea, if the levels of conjugated, indirect bilirubin cannot go and be excreted via kidney, that cannot happen, okay? So in urine, you only see conjugated bilirubin, okay? Let's move on. Now, there is a ductular system within the liver. The ducts which are within the liver are called intrahepatic ducts 
and the ducts which are outside the liver are called extrahepatic duct. There is no fun in telling you this because this is pretty self-explanatory. Intrahepatic ducts and extrahepatic ducts. Now, if there is blockage at any level, either intrahepatic duct or extrahepatic duct, things will be pulled up. They will not be secreting out of the liver, but that will be pulled up. And that pulling is what we call cholestasis. Cholestasis is blockage either inside the liver or outside the liver. Okay, let's move on. If there is cholestasis, if there is blockage, what will happen in the blood? In blood, the levels of direct bilirubin, direct bilirubin will be high. So your liver is actually conjugating, but that conjugated bilirubin is not getting out of the liver. So it will be spilled in the blood. So in blood, direct bilirubin levels will be high. Also indirect bilirubin levels will be, will be high because liver functioning capacity will be low and there will be increased alkaline phosphorase. So these three are the markers for cholestatic liver disease, okay? And also in the urine, there will be indirect bilirubin. So whenever there is cholestasis, this is all what should be expected in your LFTs, okay? Now, let us talk about each marker of cholestasis one by one. So cholestatic marker, first of all, alkaline phosphatase. You are familiar with this figure now? There is liver and inside the liver, indirect bilirubin is going and that is being conjugated and then getting out as a direct bilirubin, okay? And in alkaline phosphatase raised, whenever there is cholestasis, whenever there is cholestasis, blockage of biliary ducts, alkaline phosphatase levels go up. But it also goes up in pregnancy or bone turnover. So therefore, alkaline phosphatase is not a very sensitive marker for liver disease, okay? And therefore, sometimes GGT, which is more specific to the liver, is used. Now, look at this figure now. We are talking about another cholestatic marker, which is indirect bilirubin. You know this figure. This is very much normal to you now. RBCs release indirect bilirubin, and indirect bilirubin gets into the liver, gets conjugated, and comes out as direct bilirubin, okay? Now, what happens in when whenever there is increased RB, what does that basically mean? So think about it. When you have any disease where there is a lot of red blood cell turnover, hemolysis, Think about hemolytic anemias. In hemolytic anemias, red blood cells will be in large number, they will be destroyed. And when they are destroyed quite a lot, what do you think? Unconjugated bilirubin will be produced in large amount or small amount? In large amount. So therefore, whenever there is a problem in red blood cell turnover, it increases, indirect bilirubin increases because indirect bilirubin is produced from hemolysis of RBCs. So more hemolysis and more indirect bilirubin. That's the normal thing. One thing can also happen. Either red blood cells are being destroyed too much or red blood cells are being destroyed normally, but when it comes to the liver, the liver machinery for conjugation is not working. If liver machinery is not working, it will never be conjugated or it will be conjugated to a very, very low level. For example, there's a disease called Gilbert's disease, which is very common, by the way, three to 5% of the population has Gilbert disease. Now, Gilbert disease, the enzymatic machinery is defective. So therefore, when indirect bilirubin comes in the liver, it is not conjugated. And if it is not conjugated, levels of indirect bilirubin will go high. So remember this, indirect bilirubin, always think about red blood cell turnover, always think about problems in conjugation, okay? And when do you expect direct bilirubin to be very high? Any blockage. If there is any intrahepatic blockage or extrahepatic blockage, these levels be very high. And whenever you talk about extrahepatic blockage, think about solid masses, think about tumors. I told you that in the first picture, if you remember, the common bile duct drains into duodenum. And this is the anatomic location where the head of the pancreas is, is, you know, around that part. And if there is a pancreatic cancer, for example, CBD will be blocked. As a result of which jaundice will happen, bilirubin levels will go up. And if the bilirubin levels will go up, I ask you, which bilirubin levels will be very high? Conjugated. Because liver is conjugating, but it's not getting out, okay? And because conjugated levels will be high, it will also appear in the urine. So remember all these things, right? Now, there are some clinical scenarios for you to spend some time on and try to understand. This should make sense to you. Let's talk about this clinical scenario. At the top are alkaline phosphatase, direct bilirubin, indirect bilirubin, and total bilirubin. And these are what? Cytotoxic markers or damage markers? These are all 
cholestasis markers, okay? On, on the disease panel, there is primary biliary cirrhosis. Now, primary biliary cirrhosis is by and large intrahepatic damage. So whenever I told you there is intrahepatic damage, the levels of alkaline phosphatase will be high, of course. The levels of total bilirubin will be high because there will be blockage. And which levels will be more high? Direct, which means conjugated or conjugated. Because the liver is conjugating appropriately, but it's not going down in the duodenum. So in the, in the blood, more and more conjugated bilirubin will go. So the conjugated levels will be more high uh, and the unconjugated levels will be uh, high, but not to the extent of uh, the conjugated bilirubin levels, okay? So go through these diseases, try to make sense out of it. If you don't understand, go back to the lecture, try to understand it again, okay? And they all are cholestatic problems. So for example, primary sclerosing cholangitis, there is blockage of intrahepatic as well as extrahepatic ducts, and there is large bile duct obstruction, again obstruction, uh, alkaline phosphatase will go up, total bilirubin will go up, direct bilirubin will go up, and indirect bilirubin will go up as well, okay? Now, let us talk about some clinical scenarios where there is some um, cellular, hepatocellular damage. For example, in all the viral hepatitis, hepatitis A, B, C viruses, I told you, ALT is a little more specific. So ALT levels will go up more compared to the AST, but in alcoholic hepatitis, note that AST levels are going more up as compared to ALT, okay? In rest of the diseases, both of them actually go equally high, okay? So that's all. In LFTs, you have to think about when you are analyzing and visualizing the report, there are cholestatic markers and there are damage markers, okay? And you analyze them separately. That's all for today's lecture and I'll be back to you with another video very soon. Thank you very much.